So Duke basically decided, hey, you know what? We got some influencers that probably go to our college. I don't know. Why don't we why don't we just make a class for them? Nationers, 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 what is good? Welcome back to another episode of The Realist Podcast. The banner is actually behind me this time. For any audio listeners, um, the banner is behind me. We've kind of switched it up somewhat again. I'm still kind of testing out how this room could be uh, fully encompassed because it is still kind of uh, maybe not fully meant for a single person. And I feel like that was... Something that I didn't really think about when I first started this podcast. Whereas if we have two people, I know the setup. I know where all the lights need to be. I know where things need to be. Whereas when it's just a solo episode like this one, episode 35, this is this this whole setup is something that I don't quite know uh, as of as of now. But I'm still learning. I feel like this setup might might offer a little bit more to it. You know, you guys get to still see the banner. And that was the one main thing that I had an issue with. Like I could get like a good angle, but you couldn't see the banner. You physically couldn't see the banner. It'd be like a little corner, like cut out of the section. And it just, it, it, I was like, well, I spent money on the banner. I, you know, spent money on the photos, took all the photos with the amazing guests. It doesn't, doesn't do it justice to just get a little corner of it. It's like, I bought, I bought a $10 pizza, but I, I, I only I only get to eat one slice for myself. Like that didn't really translate very well. And I wanted to make sure that this was a proper setup. So what I did is nationers, I um hold on. I'm gonna take you guys for a ride here. I took the haptic glass or like the the like the glass off it. So like you guys can probably hear it. If I go like this, you could you can't hear me. I feel like I'm behind like a telephone booth, like talking to a teller. Yeah, that's uh that's that. So you could like if you're on if you're watching on video, you could see the light that's obviously right there. Whereas since I took it out, uh which was a process, let me let me tell you. Uh it was a process. I took it out because I was like every time there was a light shining on it, it just didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense. So, uh, I took it out. You couldn't see like half of the half of the things. So now you're able to kind of see it. And yeah, I still feel like it's, I, I feel as if this is a good setup as of right now, but let me know in the comments what you guys think of the kind of like head on shot. <laughs> um, other than that, Nationers, episode 35, going to be talking about a few things that have kind of been on my mind and then a few things that have kind of happened that I don't know if many people know about, um, which we're going to get into one here. And you guys probably are looking at the title of this episode of what in the world is a university doing creating a class for influencers? Yeah, I said the same thing when I first saw it, but I was like, I thought about it a little bit more and uh, I'm going to share kind of like my, my thought process of it. Is it good? Is it bad? Um, and then also I did a Spartan race last week, so that's why there wasn't an episode last week, so... I decided, I'm like, oh, hold up, we should probably, <laughs> we, I, I didn't uh, get around to like mentioning it, but that's why there wasn't an episode last week. I'm going to be talking about that Spartan race in this episode, and then also, I was planning on uh, recording this video, this episode, before Kendrick Lamar had dropped an album. However, Kendrick Lamar has dropped an album, um, so we're going to be talking about that today, because uh, it is... It, it, it's a it's a jam packed one. It is it is one of those ones where I have a lot to talk about. Whereas like last episode, I did not have a lot to talk. I did not have a lot to talk about. So again, nationers, welcome back to the episode. Uh, welcome back to the episode. Yeah, welcome back to the episode. You know, the episode. You know what it is. <laughs> welcome back to the cafe. Your sign says pizzeria. I mean, welcome back to the cafe. You know, um, anyways, Nationers, Duke University. Uh, you guys may know Duke University if you guys watch men's basketball. If you guys watch really any collegiate sport, Duke is one of the high, high-end high athletic sports. It's also a very high-end academic um, college and university. I don't know what the difference between college and university is. You know, like, I know, like, is it, it's the same thing, no? 
maybe it's just like a different term, like son as in to brother. It like means the same thing, but it's just like at, at a different angle. I don't know. Let me know because I, I, I'm still kind of confused on that. However, um, Duke University decided to release a, um, a course, like a, a, a class. That's it. I, probably, I, I think a class is probably the best way to put it. So Duke basically decided, hey, you know what? We got some influencers that probably go to our college, and I don't know why don't we why don't we just make a class for them? They could take a class to learn about influencer um, brand partnerships. They can learn about like deals within that. They can learn about I don't know what I don't know if they learn about the algorithm. I think they just kind of like learn how to be an influencer. So there's two things that kind of come to mind with this is. One, are they, like, teaching them, like, how to make an apology video for, like, YouTube or, like, TikTok? You know, are they going to pull a CNMA and make, like, an interpretive dance and be like, Ooh, I am so sorry. I am too young. Like, what? Okay. Are we going to, are they doing that? Are they, are they like, what are, what are they teaching exactly? Are they teaching them how to market themselves? That, I feel like that route is a little bit more, more aligned with what I would like to think. Like if I were to sign up for this class, I would, I would hope that this class, A, is one that is teaching me maybe like how to market myself. You know, obviously the brand partnership, I feel like that's like a very uh, underutilized and untouched topic. Um, you know, whether that be like a TikTok, um, they, they, I think they're specifically going for short form creators which is your your TikToks, your Instagram Reels. You could probably even even maybe put Facebook on there. Um, different short form platforms, probably like YouTube Shorts as well. Like short form in general. Um, I imagine they're probably learning a little bit about like how to tell a story. You know, like some like twelfth, like not even twelfth grade, like fourth grade English class like type stuff. But obviously a little bit more in depth. However. Um, that's like one thing. I'm like, what are they teaching? Is it this, you know, uh, are they trying to train them to be like, you know, appropriate? The college students, they're going to make a mistake. Hypothetically, you know, it's, it's a little inevitable. Or is it like, you know, how, how, how to stuff of that nature. This is the line that I like. I like that how to stuff like, oh, you want to learn about this? Here we go. We're, we're going to both talk about it in course six, chapter two. Okay, pull out your notebooks. I'm like, what? Um, my headphones just break? No, they're not. They did not just break, but you guys just got hit with my headphones. I like dropped the cord and I felt like it yank. I'm like, oh, good golly. However, that's like one thing. And then like the second thing, which is kind of escaping right now. Uh, I had it when I first said it, but it's maybe more or less like along the lines this class, if I like, again, if I'm signing up for this class, I'd have like two questions. What are they teaching me? And then two, why did they start this? Why did they start this? And I first asked myself that question when I first saw this headline and I was like, you know what? It kind of seems a little odd, you know, that like they're, 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 it's a selective class. You know, like if you ever in high school, like you, have you ever had like a selective class where you have to like meet a certain criteria or you have to like be, uh, you have to have like a teacher recommendation or something. You have to like audition. Like for me, one of these classes for me was back in high school. I was a part of the uncle orchestra and a part of being a part of the a part of being a part of that selective orchestra was you had to audition. So you had to like physically do something to be a part of that uncle orchestra. And so with that, that was something that, um, essentially just kind of came with the class. Like if you want to be a part of this class, you have to audition. So I imagine a part of this class is you have to be an influencer. And I don't know what that criteria looks like. Like can anyone like wanting to start just take it? Or is it you have to be at least like at 100,000 like followers on like, I don't know, any platform. Whereas like 100,000 on Instagram is quite a lot, but 100,000 on TikTok isn't a lot, you know? So like do you have like a flatline basis or I don't know, like, are they taking like people who do like Twitch stuff? Are they taking people who want to be like a business or like, what are they taking? You know, like who are they taking in? What is, what is their reach? Because in my mind, it's just influencers. It's people who, you know, are picking up their phone, 
and taking a video. I feel like a little boomer doing this. I'm not going to lie. I'm almost 21 years of age, and I feel like a boomer. <laughs> However, that's, that's something that I also want to know is kind of what reach is, are, they, are they trying to hit? It's a very interesting class. It makes sense. You know, they're college students. There's probably, again, college students at their university who are, you know, influencers, people who make content, you know? And so with the prioritization towards short form, I feel like it could be a little bit of a detriment. I feel like there's obviously two different things that you kind of have to look at. Um, is it more umbrella like influencer marketing? Uh, I don't recall what they called it. They called it, they did not call it influencer marketing class. They called it like a really odd class, which in my mind kind of makes sense. I'm going to see if I can find it. I'm going to see if I can find the article here. Um, insane when I first saw it. Um, it's going to be deep back here. I saw it earlier this week. Let me see if I can find it here. I'm. It's on, <laughs> I found it on wrap, surprisingly. Um, how long ago was this? This was six days ago. Was it that far back? I don't know if it was that far back. Definitely wasn't a week ago. It could have been. I don't think so. Uh, I'm going to keep looking for it here, but it's so interesting to me to see. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Colleges are offering full credit TikTok classes for influencers. So, uh, let me read what the statement is. Um, Duke University offers a class called Building Global Audiences. That was the that was the title of this class, which is a full credit class dedicated to helping students optimize their presence on social media apps such as TikTok. The students have collectively gained over 150,000 followers and generated over 80 million video views in their class. Some students have even received brand deals earning up to 7,000 a month. So here, one thing, this is really odd. Saying on TikTok, like 145,000 people, like it's a lot of people. Don't get me wrong, right? That, that, that's a lot of arenas, you know? That is a lot of stadiums, right? And that's like a lot of cities, you know? That's like a lot of cities. We have we have 315 in Spokane total. So yeah, that's like basically Spokane Valley where I live, right? 80 million collective views for that. Like, the numbers don't really add up. I'm, I mean, I'm assuming these people aren't, like, doing, like, a like a, a CTA. They don't have, like, a CTA on this where they're, like, hit that follow button, right? I don't. I imagine they're not. They're probably just, like, trend type stuff for the most part. Um, $7,000 a month in brand deals is, is, is not bad. That probably pays for a little bit of a portion of their, their college. Saying, saying... This is interesting because this also brings up another conversation that we talked about last, last like uh, summer where college athletes can now get endorsements. They can get endorsed by certain companies. They could be partnered with certain companies. They could be partnered with YouTube. They could be partnered with Twitch. They can be partnered um, on the creator fund for TikTok, which is really cool, right? You could be partnered. You could get money for creating content. Whereas if you were a part of any college or you were a college athlete, I think it was primarily athletes, you couldn't do any of that. You unfortunately couldn't make any money for your image likeness and like that as a whole. So like I couldn't be like put like faces of myself on shirts and selling them to people. Like I couldn't do that. I couldn't make any sort of money around my image and likeness because I was a college athlete. Like, how dumb was that? Like, if you if you narrow it down to, like, the, the baseline thing, it doesn't make any sense. But, like, that's interesting. Because now this is, this is a class that can actually be implemented in so many other colleges and other universities. I still don't know if they're the same thing, but correct me if I'm wrong. Colleges and universities and institutions across, you know, like, prestigious D1, D2, D3 colleges and even JUCO. I imagine my my guess is Duke is going to be the first of many. Duke will be the first of many. There are so many talented content creators that go to all these colleges. It's not bad if you could get a credit, depending on if it really fits your uh, your major. You know, like I imagine some some people are probably like college athletes, but then you know, like majoring in nursing. They're not probably going to take this class because it probably doesn't really fit in their curriculum. So. 
I mean, it's a win-lose type situation. I don't know. However, it's still a win because influencers and people who are making content, content creators, that is, are able to do stuff like this. They're able to learn. Like, I've, I've been able to learn. Like, I don't have to pay a college tuition, but I've been able to learn a lot about YouTube. And I've learned a lot through other people. And I think it's like, with a wealth of knowledge, it's great out there. I don't know who's teaching these classes, by the way. I don't know if it's like Professor Professor Griggs, who's like 87 years old and like barely picked up an iPhone for the first time. Or if it's like maybe like a hip, young, you know, 32-year-old who's done some, you know, social media work. I don't know. that. That's interesting on who's teaching these classes. Is it just like a, like an, a third party? Like, I don't know. That, that interests me because... That that does kind of change my view on it just ever so slightly. However, as a whole, I think it's a good idea, and I think there will be many more classes like this in other institutions. So that's really all I had to do with Duke University. I know I talked a handful on it, but I feel like it's super important to understand where where influencer slash content creator um Things are going, you know, I feel like it's, it's been a little bit more accepted. Um, you know, I've always felt like it's been accepted mainly because like, I never really was deterred by like, Oh, like you make YouTube videos. Like, yeah, I make YouTube videos. Okay. Like what? Like, that's what I do. Like, are you, am I going to lie about that? You know, like I was usually pretty honest in my approach and anything that was like backlash or anything that was pushing against the grain, like it wasn't really, it didn't really push me back and it really didn't really like catch me off guard either a because i was used to it or two it was just what i did like if i told somebody i did welding it's like oh you're doing welding it's the exact same thing as if i tell somebody i'm doing youtube and they're like oh you do youtube the response is the exact same like it doesn't matter what i'm doing you know like i could be doing so many different things and if the reaction is just the same it doesn't really matter to me and mind you this is different for everybody you know because people hold you know values differently for what their occupation is however um, like this kind of brings up something because, um, last year last or yeah, coming up soon, um, we're going to hit our one year on this podcast, which I'm super happy about. We're super duper happy about Two, Um, I remember at least releasing a video in this exact same spot, which is really interesting. I remember releasing a video where I announced that I was not going to go back to college and funny enough, it was because I was going to go do YouTube. I was going to go do content creation full time. But I also found this sport called Spartan racing and uh, op- optical course racing. And it was one of those things that like I didn't know that I was going to be able to. I didn't know I was going to do it when I first made the video. Right. It, it was just something that popped up on my on my radar. And I've told the story so many times in past episodes. But for anyone that doesn't know, I was going to do a summer bucket list. Ended up not doing it surprisingly. Like many things I haven't done. Um. But I was like, I wanted to do this like dirty dash, but then I was like, ah, uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't really seem fun. Like it, like I want to build a spectacle, right? I want to build like a big thing. So I was like, oh, I remember these Spartan races and there happened to be one in Portland, which is super close. So I did it and I trained for it. So that's what I did. Blink, boom, bada, bing. That's in short. And I've done, uh, Portland. I've done Seattle. I have done, um, Sacramento. I've done... SoCal, and I've done Montana. So this is my fifth race. I knew it was my fifth race, but I, I needed to name them all for some reason. I don't know why I named them all for some reason. But I did my Montana one. I signed up for like with like three days left to go because I saw it on my Instagram. And like I like a lot of Spartan stuff. And like Spartans, their advertising team, who's ever doing this marketing, like I'm running ads, you're hitting your market. Let me tell you, you are surely hitting your market. I am a Spartan athlete. I've signed up for a Spartan race before. I follow a lot of Spartan athletes. I follow Spartan race and Spartan. Yeah, you're surely hitting your demographic. You're, you're hitting your mark. It's like team up, get paid. I'm like, yes, I know. I've seen this ad 87 times in this week. This week. However, I had seen it. It's like, oh my gosh, for like three more days until the Montana Super. I was like, oh my gosh, there's one in Montana. I'm like, it's four hours away. Count me in. I was like, let's go. I'm like, this is what I need. I just need, I need to get in a race, you know, because I've been training 
since uh, January, February through April and, and oh, don't forget March. I almost forgot March. And I've been training for some time and I was like, you know, what? it's finally time to start doing it. It's, it's, you know, it's time to do it. You've done enough work, Jared. It's time to get into it. And I did it. I did really well. I was surprised. So I normally run the sprint, which is a 5K, roughly. It usually, it usually goes a little over a 5K, but they don't want to be like 5.5K. Like, like they're just like 5K. It's easy enough. And then this one's a 10K, so it's around six miles. This one's 6.3, or excuse me, six and three quarters miles. Um, so it's almost seven miles in, in length. However, um, I was like, there's no sprint. There's only an afternoon sprint. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to run age group. I want to run competitively. And I was like, okay, mom. So if I'm going to do the sprint, we'll just leave in the morning of Sunday, right? Excuse me. But if I'm doing the sprint, we're going to have to stay the night. So we stayed the night. Uh, I ended up doing the sprint eventually. I did the uh, age group sprint or age group super. It's weird saying super that I did that. But, you know, longer race, more obstacles, obstacles that I haven't done before. So it was pretty cool. Like it was, it was a really unique experience. And then not only that, um, so me and my mom drive over to Calus Bell roughly. Um, and we stay in a hotel, which is like iconic. It's historic. It was like 1908 was when it was built. It has like you, instead of like a key card, you know, like how you just like this, imagine this is a key instead of like buzzing in and turning it. You have like a physical key, like to your house. And it's just like to a room and you turn it and it opens your door, you know? And so it's really odd. But then me and my mom, like there's only one bed. I was going to sleep on the cot. I ended up watching like the UFC, watching some YouTube videos. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to fall asleep on the bed. It's probably going to be better for me. So I, my mom's sleeping on one side of the bed. I'm sleeping on the other. And I'm just like, I ended up facing like the opposite way because I couldn't go to bed. And yeah, so then I ended up like, this is my feet. I don't know how to describe it. I like my feet were at her head and my mom's head and then vice versa. And then I ended up falling asleep. I got like four hours of sleep before the race and then ended up racing. Um, so that was a ton of fun. The race was not too bad. It was supposed to be like super snowy and super rainy. So I, I dressed up really warm. I usually don't dress up. I usually race without a shirt, but this time I raced with a shirt, um, for the first time. So things are, I don't know, maybe it maybe it's a reverse psychology. I, I don't know. However, um, overall I placed seventh in my age group. This was a tough age group. There's a lot of really good athletes who, um, raced really well, raced really, really well. And then, um, I came 29th overall out of like, I don't remember how many people raced. In the super, um, I'd have to look again, but um, yeah, I placed 29th, which is pretty good. It wasn't like 50; it was definitely like in the hundreds. But I still, I still feel happy, you know, because I hadn't really ran. I don't run like six miles roughly. I don't run like nine miles to train for a six mile race, like I, because I didn't expect to do a six mile race. But I still held my own. There was one really brutal hill. It was like that steep. My calves were like, oh god, they were shattered after the race. Um, but it was just one of those things that it really helped me, you know, as I'm training more and going up hills a lot, I was like, yeah, this is really nice. So overall, a great race, really happy with the results. And most importantly, when I first signed up for the very first Spartan race that I was going to do, I said, you know, under an hour, which was pretty reasonable. And then not only that, but fail, no obstacles. Don't fail an obstacle, Jared. And guess what? I didn't fail a single obstacle, even with obstacles that I hadn't done before and obstacles that I had failed before. And I feel like there's something um, to say about that. There was a few obstacles when I was down in Sacramento um, and down in, um, what is it? Down in Sacramento and down in um, SoCal, I had failed. Like the monkey bars, I had failed both times. The multi-rig, I had failed uh, at the Sacramento one. And I just didn't do well on any of like the, the holding ones for some odd reason. Like I was really good at them at, at the previous two at Portland and Seattle. Um, however, this one was just a little bit different. Um, I just, I had failed those ones. And then this one I got in and I tried a different strategy. So instead of swinging, I would match. So all my momentum still going forward instead of like trying to go back. And then like, especially on like a even plane where it's like that, where it's straight across you can't turn anything like on the multi-rig where it swings. It's great because you're creating like a longer angle for yourself. So it works out, but on the monkey bars, you can't like do that. 
because the bar doesn't move. You know, it doesn't like move with you. So that's, you get prone to falling. So I was just boop, 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 boop. And I'd match and it worked out really well. And there's a few obstacles that again, I hadn't had done beforehand, but other, nonetheless, like it was really good. And, and the thing to be said about it is no matter if you failed like beforehand, you have experience from what has worked and what hasn't worked. And that's like a huge thing, you know, like at the Sacramento one, it was super wet, you know? So like I can learn, I'm like, how do I keep my hands dry? You know, how do I keep more things dry to make sure that when I'm doing that obstacle, I can successfully do it at an optimal and an optimized rate. And, you know, my technique at the SoCal wasn't great. And I fell like on like the second monkey bar. I'm like, what in the world? What is going on? And so I, you know, I learned through those situations. And no matter if you're failing or if you have failed at something, you learn from the experience of doing. And that's the biggest thing that I want at least hopefully somebody to take from this episode when I'm talking about these Spartan races. Like it was my first one that I hadn't failed a single obstacle. Got to the spear throw. They put it at like the, the last two obstacles. So they had the firewall, slip wall, and then the spear throw. Those were like, well, those were the last few obstacles. So firewall is the last one, slip wall, and then spear throw. Picked it up, boom, chucked it. You know, in my practice, I didn't practice, unfortunately. I, I like totally forgot to practice my spear throw. But I practiced it enough. I went for three weeks straight just practicing every single day my spear throw. So when I picked up the spear throw the, uh, that race, I just picked it up and just went. And I just nailed it. I was like, my, it was probably my best spear throw. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that was super awesome. And overall did decently well. My time was pretty good. I think it was 120. It was in the 120s. I don't know if it was 129 or 1. 20 something. I don't recall what it was. Um, I know I, I told my mom I was going to be, a, Oh, 127. That's it. 127. I remember sharing it on my Instagram so I can, I can pull it up here to like confirm because I don't want to be wrong about my time and be like, Jared, you actually did. You actually went a little bit slower, huh? Um, yeah. 127 49. Um, so yeah, I was really, really happy about that. I w- I, yeah, I was just overall really, really happy about that. You know, I hadn't had a race like that before and, you know, it, it was what it was. And that was, that was the race, you know, that was the race that I didn't expect to do short notice. And no matter what, I still conquered, you know, what was a challenge for me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that it's my first ever super. It's the first one that I didn't fail an obstacle. And I, and I, I, I like, I could be proud of myself. You know what I'm saying? Um, other than that, Kendrick Lamar, Kendrick Lamar, I want to get into this here in a sec. So Kendrick Lamar basically dropped an album. Um, we had kind of known that he was going to drop an album. He had released some stuff, um, probably like a few months back talking about there will be an album soon. You know, he's, you know, talked about there's, there's going to be something, you know, in the future. We just don't know when. And he had dropped um, a little teaser on April 18th talking about, you know, effective statement, issued statement at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Cool, cool, cool. Releasing an album. Like it was, it was, a, it was like a Michael Jordan, like I'm back, like type thing. It was basically that. And um, Kendrick Lamar, if you don't know, doesn't use a whole lot of social media. He's not big into the social media realm. So, you know, you, you would expect, you know, um, as one does that you don't really know what he's going to talk about, you know, like he dropped the, the heart part five, which was not a part of the album as they usually aren't, if I'm not wrong. And he had dropped that, which had some incredible deep fakes in it had OJ Simpson, had Kanye West, Jesse Smollett, had Will Smith, had Kobe Bryant and Nipsey Hussle. Um, Incredible, incredible artwork by him and the vision to portray these lines within uh, other black uh, influences throughout the world. You know, Kobe Bryant, he talks about like being bipolar or some uh, some cases of that, you know, friends bipolar. And so, you know, I can't really represent that with anything else, but we know Kanye does have, you know, bipolar, you know, he bipolar disorder. He has bipolar. Yeah, he, he has bipolar. Um but yeah, Kanye West, uh, obviously, you know, Ye, as we know, I'm using his artist name. However, you know, like, um, 
like Jesse Smollett, who was somebody who uh, apparently got caught in like a fake hate crime attack, you know, and like a line, he's like, I'm trying to rep- represent for us. But, you know, he kind of talks about different lines about that. And um, he talks about like OJ Simpson about like, m- not like murdering, but like he talks about what it's like to be in a bulletproof rover, different lines like that. Can't really relate it to a whole lot of things because I haven't done full in depth about it, but this is just kind of what I remember from other people talking about it. And then when he talks a lot about Nipsey Hussle, um, this is, there's kind of like these three verses where it's kind of almost like a past, present and future kind of vibe. Um, but he kind of like, he's talking off camera, talking to somebody off camera and he's talking about like more or less like his impact on like, not like black culture, but the, the conversation of black culture. And it's really interesting because he's like talking off camera to somebody and it breaks down into this Marvin Gaye, um, like breakdown, this kind of like chorus almost. It's almost like a slightly an interlude, but it's not, it's, it basically is the chorus. And he's like, I want you, I want to know, I forget how it goes. I want, I want to know if you want me to that, that's it. And he like talks about like the hood. He's like, I want the hood to want me back, you know, because he's done so much, even though he's at like a different level, because he's came from the hood. That's where he's from. But now he's at like a really, you know, superstar, you know, level, right? He's a very influential artist. And he's like, I want the, I want the hood, you know, look what I've done for you. Look what I've done for you. And it's kind of like, almost like this, like, like soapbox in a way, but like, Soapbox without the box, in a way, where he's kind of like talking, like as if he's on a soapbox, almost like preaching, but he's on the same level as you. We're all on a soapbox, you know? He's trying to empower everybody to have a soapbox so that they could have a voice and they can talk about their own narrative. And when he talks about like the hood, like I want the hood to want me too. Like I want the hood, you know, back. Look what I've done for you. Look what I've done for you. Like this, this really emotional breakdown and uh yeah he goes throughout a whole bunch of these different artists and he portrays them because these are like these moments in time that kind of reflect who he is um and you understand when he's talking to you because he's looking at the camera but if he's talking off off camera as he does at the beginning and the end that's when you start understanding like he's not talking to you he's talking to either a outside voice or to somebody else. It could be a mirror. It could be to himself. However you want to portray that. But the hard part five, again, not on the album. Um, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. Really interesting album to say the least. So in short, this album um, is a two disc. It has like these two parts. So the first nine uh, songs, first nine plays uh, on the list are basically the big steppers. This is talking about like the big steppers. Um, and then the second nine are Mr. Morale. So he kind of talks about the first nine are kind of talking about like old Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar, as we know, as we used to know him as K dot, that was like his name. Um, whereas he kind of goes back through these, um, not like through these roots, but he kind of like almost, he talks a lot about like this very present day, you know, um, thing. And when he talks about like the big steppers and correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but for anyone that knows, um, please again, feel free to correct me. But when he's talking about big steppers, he's talking more or less about I'm trying to find a way to portray this because it, it is kind of tough. Um, I guess I could talk about the morale. I, I know I know a little bit more about the morale. I do might need to read up on the big steppers a little bit more. Um, but M- Mr. Morale or the morality side of things, he's talking about like a lot of humanitarian things. Like he talks about like a transgender um, aunt. He talks about a transgender, I think it's his cousin. Demetrius is Marianne now. Um, let me see. Uh, meaning of... Big steppers. Meaning of big steppers? I spelled meaning wrong. Um, big steppers. Okay, this Okay, this is what I thought it was. Okay? So the big steppers, the muscle, the one who gets the job done. That's Okay, that's what I thought it was. But I was, I 
I know I'd, I'd heard a few different things kind of around that, but I didn't know how to consolidate it into one. So it's like somebody who gets that job done, um, a slightly selfish overachiever. Um, that's kind of, yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, yeah, that definitely makes sense because in that first half of the album, he's talking about like the things that he's achieved and things that he's done. And, um, it kind of has this very, like, not like 180 tone shift because it still feels like the same kind of ping pong, uh, that's going on within this album. But the morale side is again, talking a lot about, uh, the morality of things that he's done, uh, about cheating on his fiance, like morally, you know, he feels convicted, you know, because that he knew that that's a wrong that he did. He's also talked about like the questioning of transgenderism and like that side of that within his own family, but then also dealing and battling with this faith that he's going through. And he talks about like in that song, um, auntie's diary where a preacher was like, no, that's, that's just is what it is, you know, like, but he's so young, he doesn't really know how to see the world. And that was like a big thing that I think he talks about a lot where there is this very ambiguous thing that he doesn't know how to accept or understand, you know, like I, I don't understand like rocket science, you know, it's such an ambiguous thing, but if you can break it down for me, you know, share with me, with me a little bit of this like analogy or something, you know, and he talks about that a lot in savior. Um, one of my favorite interludes probably that I've ever heard with the baby Keem, uh, another artist, his, his cousin, um, on that song. It's not a song. It's an interlude, but I'm going to refer to it as a song and then savior. So he talks about, it's kind of, he uses himself in the third person at the intro of this. He's like, Kendrick gave, made you feel blank, but he's not your savior. He's trying to, I guess, trying to align himself in the right light, you know, like understand that like all these things are really nothing if you're not willing to do any action. Um, really love Savior. I love the Sam Drew um, chorus on there with Baby Keem on one of them and then Baby Keem does the other one. And um, yeah, overall, just like a really good song. My favorite song though on the Kendrick Lamar album is N95. Um, it really gives me like this, like damned humble type vibe, probably more, um, damned than humble, but it really, really like brings back that somewhat generic, not generic, but nostalgic Kendrick. That's what I meant to say. Um, was where he has like these little ad libs, hold up, hold up. Like, it's just like, it's really, really energetic. And, uh, his flow is flow and delivery on it is really, really crisp. And I really like it. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, um, feel free to let me know because I, I, I might be, it might be really ambiguous that I don't know how to like condense it down into something, but I can surely work on it. And if you guys haven't gave it a listen, feel free to give it to a listen. Uh, it is explicit just so you guys know, but it, it's, it's a really solid album. I think he touches on a lot of things that many people are a little bit too, um, a bit too afraid to talk about. It kind of feels like Elon Musk Cause like you can't really confine Elon Musk to any really like political box, you know. You can't like really put him more on the right side, the conservative side. You can't really put him more on the liberal left side. But it's really interesting because, like, Elon Musk is just kind of like this middle ground for a lot of people. He's not like any of these extremes. He's just like a very, very middle ground type of person, you know. He kind of bases it in like common sense and morality, you know, and just like basic things, you know, that we've been learned to learn to know. It's nothing too extreme. It's not like, what if, what, what, what that just like a draw the line. This is the middle ground that we kind of choose. Whereas I think uh, Kendrick Lamar kind of does that same thing where, you know, there's a lot of rappers, you know, like cancel culture, stuff of that nature. And there's a lot of like capitalistic things that he talks about um, where he kind of like, he understands where people are at the, at the, you know, kind of the bottom end of the spectrum. And he understands that like, there are people who are just like using you. Um, N95 is a great song for that. You know, he's like, um, or kind of like this thing where you kind of feel like you're inferior to somebody, like somebody's living it up in Dubai with a Rolex and really nice dresses or really nice suits. But there's a real world outside. You know, he's trying to bring you back in to realize like, Without any of these things, you are you are simply nothing. If your whole personality is based on design or clothes, you are simply nothing. 
without it, right? And he and he mentions in that in in kind of like the first um, take off the eye, like take off take off. It, it's this really like first verse, um, and he talks about, um, and and in Savior he talks about. Um, I forget the lyric. It talks about like. Um, I really, I really need to look it up because I don't want to mess up a Kendrick Lamar lyric. I know if I listen to it, I, I will definitely know what it is. Um, let's go to genius here. We're, we're doing a live, live thing here. Um, savior, savior, savior. There it is. There it is. Um, he talks about it in the last verse here. He also talks a lot about COVID too. And he talks more or less about like his, um, like, not, like, battle with it, you know, like, a lot of people have battled with it, but he talks about, like, how it's really affected him to a, to a certain extent, but he talks about the counties of the bad, I am not your savior, I do find it difficult to love thy neighbor, especially when people got ambiguous favors, but their heart's not in it, see, everything's, everything's for the paper, the struggle from the right side of history, the struggle for the right side of history, independent thought is like an internal enemy, inter- eh, eternal enemy, capitalist posing as compassions be offending me. Where he talks, you know, like any capitalistic person that kind of uses things, like, no, this is for the betterment of you, but kind of like using the system. He also talks, there's also one line that I really like. Oh, he talks about, do you want peace? Then watch us in the streets. One protest for you, 365 for me, you know, where it's like almost like this everyday protest, you know, and though he may not be out there every day, through, he's found a different means to protest. It's through his music, it's through his art. That is his way of protesting. Um, and yeah, overall a great album. I don't know what I'd rank it as of right now. Um, I definitely give it anything above a nine. Uh, I don't know if it's like a 9.7, like, like some levers might be higher. Like, I don't know how sonically, sonically it sounds really good. Like it sounds really crisp. There's nothing that really sounds like it wasn't thought about. Um, lyrics though, flow, like, you know, obviously very high, but like, what are the other metrics that I might be looking at? Um, and keeping that consistent, of course. But overall, a 9 out of 10 plus album. So take that as what you is. But I definitely wanted to talk about it because I feel like it's, it is it is important to talk about. There are things that aren't necessarily talked about. There aren't things um, that he doesn't really touch on. There, there definitely are things, again, that don't get talked about. And, you know, I feel like he's obviously not afraid to kind of cross that line. Um, but not in a bad way. You know, he's not crossing the line. You know, like, imagine there's, like, a two castles feuding, right? And there's, like, a line drawn in the in this. There's, like, a giant trench, right? He's not crossing that line from one castle to another to start rioting and, and wars and whatnot. He's not trying to cause uproars. He's trying to bring in the awareness of what that could do. He just He's simply going over there to make peace, right? Um, and just bring up, like, things that need to be talked about. And I feel like... I feel like he did a really good job about that with this album. I do like the the overlapping of big steppers and the the morale side of things. And yeah, I think overall it's just a it's a beautiful piece of work. Um, I definitely want to digest it a little bit more um, and just listen back to a few songs. Um, so yeah, Nationers, that is the end of episode thirty five of the Rose Podcast banner right there. I do appreciate you guys watching, listening, and most importantly, subscribing. And I'll see you guys in the next episode next Sunday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Have a good one. 07. Peace, peace.